One thing I gotta tell you about Kip, you just check this out. This guy is a shoe, a shoe man. Every week he's got the newest, latest shoe. What are, what are these, Kip? Which ones are these? Oh, these are the greatest shoe brands. See what I'm saying? <laughs> oh, shoot, I gotta figure out what these brands are. Y'all have to go buy them. Hoka, how many Hoka. of you know about Hoka? Hoka's are the best. Okay, thank you. <laughs> 42 years, uh, Kip and Sharon built the container store. 42 years, that's pretty darn amazing. Thank you, Kip, for those kind words. And it's a good morning to hear, I, I thought Hamdi's heart and Paul, that whole discussion was wonderful. I don't know how many of you watched the debate last night, but business is under attack. And uh, folks are going after capitalism like it's an evil thing. And when you hear, when you hear the heart of Hamdi and Paul and others here, uh, we realize how, just how much business can do. So I'm a grocer, some of you know, 40 years actually, a natural one at that. And um, I thought this morning I would just share in my time some reflections about leadership. Um, these are, to, I'm sure mo you, know, you all running your own companies and so you've thought about these things or you're thinking about these things or you're working with Rand on these things. By the way, I've seen capitalism at work over here with Heath because I just left my seat and he's already taken my seat. <laughs> This is tough over here. Um, anyway, these are my reflections. There's seven thoughts, sort of areas I'm gonna share with you this morning in sort of rapid fire. And they're just my thoughts. Maybe they're helpful, I hope they're helpful to you. So uh, about being a leader and about leadership in general. So first of all is, I think the number one quality about a leader is you've gotta have a vision. You've gotta describe some big reason for being. John talks about the purpose as being at the core of our organization. Why do you exist as a company? What is that? Put it front and center. You've got to describe a big hill you're going to climb to motivate those who want to come work with you, want to motivate the world as to pay attention in a world where there's more and more brands and more and more offers. You've got to set yourself apart by having a reason for being to do something that really matters, right? You've got to have a vision. Somebody in the organization, it should be you probably, has got to have a big idea about what the business is here to do. And then you've got to have a strategy. You've got to have, a, you've got to have a, 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 an incisive amount of thinking about how you're actually going to achieve that, how you're going to accomplish that. So you've got to hone your strategic skills, your path to market. You've got to be able to see around the corner. If you're CEO, if you're not around the corner, you're too slow today. I've never seen a business environment where, where things are changing faster than they are today. Whether it's the power of technology and data or it's just the power of ideas, you've got the context from which you're bringing your business to market is faster than ever. And so having a vision, having a hill to climb, having a purpose, having a North Star, critical, having a, a strategic ability to, to sift through the noise and figure out how you're going to carve your path to market, those things are critical. And you've got to be decisive. And uh, you know, this is something John's far better at than I am, but being decisive and being able to say no to things and saying yes to things. Actually, Clayton Christopher, my friend here in Austin, says there's no more yes and no. There's just hell yes and no. Either you really want to do it or you don't do it. It's all about your intentionality. So first, vision and strategy. Number two, talent and team. Uh, you can't build a company without great talent. Nothing energizes a company more than hiring a great person, right? Or, or nothing it makes a leader feel better than seeing someone on the team rise up and do something you didn't think they could do or they didn't think they could do. Nothing energizes an organization more than that. So are you willing to, as you, as you, are you willing to, to, uh, to, to build your team out, to build your talent out, to go get the best people, even if it threatens you in some ways, where you feel like, wow, uh, they, they've got more talent than I do, or they see more than I do. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to stretch that? And are, we, are you willing to ask yourself kind of what is your role uh, to play now? Right? I think when I first started out in my little store, Mountain Mark, in 1978, that's a long time ago, I thought I had to do everything, and I did do everything. And I thought that was the right thing for the leader to do. What I've realized going over the years, and particularly as we grew at Whole Foods, was it just got too big. There was no way that you could do everything. What was more important is you created the place for other people to do everything, right? So team and talent, talent and team. Are you building a team? Are you picking the best talent? Are you willing to not be threatened by someone who's smarter or stronger or knows more than you? And then second of all, do you appreciate the power of a team, what a team really is, right? I learned this lesson a bunch of times along the way at Whole Foods where sometimes I'd get at odds with some members of the executive team and I'd realize that, you know, I was, I thought I could do it better. I didn't think they knew what they were doing, uh, but I was out of my lane, so to speak, and I had to go back and apologize. And what I really learned profoundly from that experience is uh, that actually that what team means is that you actually let the other folks on the team do what they're there to do. 
and you do what you're there to do, which some, as a CEO, and I guess co-CEOs, you're holding space for that, but that you, you, uh, you actually recognize that you're letting go in a certain way to the power of the team. And the power of the many is greater than the power of the one. Hamdi said just a minute ago, you can't do it all. You cannot do it all. What's most important for you as a leader is you're thinking about what is it the company needs you to do? What is your role that you can play? So team and talent. Third, collaboration and cooperation uh, and, and confrontation. So this idea of, uh, in today's world, uh, collaboration is a great business strategy. Because why? Speed matters in today's market. Speed really does matter. Yes, your North Star matters. Yes, your values matter. But you've got to have speed and agility and resilience. So the speed comes, one good strategy for speed is collaboration not just within the organization, but also with partner organizations that can help you to get where you want to go faster. So the collaboration, this idea of truly collaborating with others, which means you've got to listen, which means you've got to take the feedback, work with it, go with it, that sort of thing. But also confrontation, um, meeting conflict head on. I'm not as good as this. I've tried to work on it over the years. John is excellent at it. Uh, but this idea that these are both very healthy things, right? And that if you're not willing to have the conflict you can't really get all the way down in on something, right? You can't go right at, go to the full depth. Even, uh, even if you have something that you think you've reached consensus on, you should go back and put it to the stress test and say, is there anything else we haven't thought of? Where's the hole in the thinking here? Where's the, where's the hole in this argument? How do we confront this from, a, from another perspective and see if it's right? But mostly, I remember <clears throat> in the early days of Whole Foods, we had a meeting where John and Chris, Chris Hitt, some of you may remember Chris Hitt, was president at that time. And it was the first Whole Foods leadership meeting I'd ever been to. I just was a little t small town grocer before that. I came up there. I had never, you know, this was the big leagues for me. I went to the meeting, and those two were, who are deep, have deep love for one another, went at it. And I had never seen a confrontation like that. It wasn't personal. It was about the issue at hand. Um, but I was so affected emotionally that I left that room, and I cried. I cried because it hurt me to see two people going at it like that. I had no... I had no knowledge or experience prior of what it meant to confront in, in a healthy, constructive fashion, right? And so I saw, I saw then, uh, now what came out of that ultimately is they came to a place of agreement or consensus around what we were going to do. John, you may remember the, uh, the Toronto location, you and Chris going at it about whether we should do that first store in Toronto, which was underground, the parking sucked, et cetera, et cetera. We ended up deciding to do it reluctantly, but it's ended up working out pretty well for us in Toronto. But the power of both collaboration and confrontation, can you hone uh, both of those skills? Can you work on both of those skills? Are you capable in both those areas? Are you willing to embrace conflict as you are uh, a collaboration? And facing conflict, there's a lot of people that are conflict averse, would just rather stay away than deal with that when something comes up that feels uncomfortable. But the right answer is you gotta go right in at it. And you gotta just put it straight out there. You gotta have enough confidence in yourself uh, or fake the confidence in yourself to do that. Okay, so number four is really my favorite and I hope one of my contributions to conscious capitalism is culture. You've got to be, you've got to really be the one that builds culture. You've got to be the one that invests in culture. And culture for me, as I define it, is how the customers feel shopping with you and how the team members feel working with you. That's your culture, why? Because it's the mission and values given expression, it's where the people are in a company, that's what the culture is. It's where they're, it's the living, breathing, uh, living, breathing organism that basically animates an organization. And so, so what are you doing? You've got, to, you've got to lead by example. Your example sets the tone for the culture. Your behavior, your decisions, uh, uh, the decisions that you take represent that culture in action. And are you consciously being, uh, investing in your culture? So not just in your own behavior, not just in the decisions you take in this organization, which by the way, the team members are paying attention to. Are this, is this mission and values real or is it just bullshit? When it comes down to the crossroads, are we actually putting it in practice? Do we see, do we have evidence uh, that, the, that the company will actually live up to these things? So you heard in Hamdi's talk, just a moment again in Paul's talk, about how they're taking their belief around capitalism being more inclusive and they're putting it in actual form. You don't think the team members at, at Chobani see that, feel that, okay, we're here to do something big, we're here to do something real. So culture is, um, is, is so important. It really belongs on the balance sheet. No accounting firms figured out how to do that yet, but all great companies have great cultures. You can't, 
take anybody else's culture. You have to borrow from, you can borrow ideas and different things, but you have to shape it in, in the, your own fashion in your own company. But this culture thing is so important. It's just so underappreciated. Uh, it's there all the time. It's in the air all around. And what I think, one thing that I think we did well at Whole Foods over the years was to continue to invest in that by, uh, by well, by having this sort of training for our leaders. We realized at some juncture, a lot of our store leaders didn't really have, know what it meant to lead from values. They had just come along and they would come and say, well, I want the next thing. I want to be promoted. I want to run a store. I want a region. But they didn't think about the fact that we expected them to lead from values and lead from their heart and lead from the purpose of the organization, which was to bring healthier food to the world and to, bring, and to, and to do it with love and respect. And so when you're running a store from that perspective, uh, we needed to, to inject some time, so we created, we created an academy where we sent our store team leaders and other leaders to be able to learn and think about what that meant and talk with their fellow folks about what it meant to do that. A tribal gathering was something we did every year. Now, I guess it's a little more expensive, right, John? So it's every three years. But, you know, that was a million-dollar investment for us in the last few years where we brought all the tribes together to share. And culture is storytelling. It's history-telling. It's shared experience. It's... Uh, and, and all we had to do was put it in the room and away the culture went, right? It was strong. And so again, an investment in culture. Uh, cultural practices. What are your cultural practices? Again, for Whole Foods, the one that's probably most well known. And I see Raj here, and, and he uh, obviously wrote the book with John. But appreciations, right? And so at the end of every meeting, at the end of every meeting, we would, we would have to take time for appreciations. Of, of, you don't have to do it, but if you wanted to. And shifting from the focus of how do we win in the marketplace to appreciating one another, whatever it is, is a very powerful thing. That was a cultural practice, right? That's a cultural practice. What are your cultural practices? Are you thinking about them? Are you investing in them? Are you celebrating them? Are you sharing them? Are you making sure they're alive and well by some mechanism, whether it's a morale survey, whether it's walking around, uh, in what way are you continuing to make sure that your culture stays strong? And remember, it's, it's, it's a living, growing thing. It keeps changing. That's healthy. It should do that. It's never the same. But it can stay anchored in the mission and values. And so cultural, building a culture, leading from culture, investing in your culture, critical to being a successful conscious leader. Number five is the qualities of leadership. Um, and this here is my own take on it. I'm sure you have your own and you all have your own strengths. but. When I think about the qualities of a, of a successful leader, I think about the following things. Number one, first of all, I think that uh, authenticity and vulnerability is the currency of leadership today. Which is to say, if people don't feel like they can relate to you or that you can relate to the situations they're in, I almost cry listening to Hamdi's story about the worker going to Walmart in Idaho and the, 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 the pain they must feel thinking about their, their family could be torn apart at any moment. But, but if you can't lead from a place of vulnerability, be open enough and authentic enough for people to feel like you can, they can, you can relate to what's going on in their life, it can be very difficult for them to follow you fully. So authenticity and vulnerability, and those are not things you can fake. They're only things you can get there by doing the sort of work on yourself that uh, gets you to the place where you're standing in sync with yourself, right? You can, only, you can never be, I could never be a leader like John. I had to be a leader like myself. We're two different people, for example. So you've got to you've got to work on yourself in a way that starts to bring those pieces together. So you are authentic. You lead authentically from who you are, and uh, that's a good thing. It's a wonderful thing when people see that and feel that. It brings people together. I would say also bravery and courage. Bravery. I read Brene's. Brown's book, I know she's been here before, but she talked about bravery is really about the willingness of a leader to go somewhere where they don't know where the answer is. They don't really know what it is. They're willing to go there anyways and just see how it unfolds. That takes guts for a leader to hang out that way in a place where they don't exactly know how it's going to turn out. But courage and fear, and then the other side of that is fear and doubt. I, I admit to you, I have, I've had a lot, of, a lot of fears and a lot of doubts. I still do. It just, it's kind of my lifetime baggage is this fact that somewhere along the way somebody told me I wasn't really good enough, and so I had that doubt, and now I have less of it, but it still comes when it comes. Sometimes it comes right before I give a big speech, not this morning, fortunately, but sometimes it just comes, and you've got that doubt, and you say, what am I going to do with that? I've learned now to meet that and say, thank you. I, I understand why you're here, but I'm not, gonna, I'm not going there with you. But everybody has fears, right? If you're, you're bullshitting, if you say you don't have them, you do. But courage is that quality of your heart that lets you do it anyways, even though you're afraid. So the, the courage and the bravery, I love these qualities of, uh, 
of developing in yourself the courage to do things, the courage to make decisions, the courage to be bold, the courage to go out on the edge where somebody isn't already and do something magnificent out there. The very act of creation is, is, the, is the highest act, I think, at least for me as a leader, is this idea of creating something that doesn't already exist. And it takes courage to do that. It takes willingness to take chances and fail and, and all those fears and, um, you know, the, the, uh, the fears and doubts are very real. The courage is the answer, the response to that. Um, you know, I remember the first time that uh, I was a store, when I, when I sold uh, the store to John, and whenever that was, store number 12 for Whole Foods, and I got the call to, uh, to go meet John, and John said, well, I'm gonna offer you the job. I'd like you to be the regional president for Northern California. This was in a hotel room. It was pretty exciting for me. Anyways, first thing I did, I don't know if John knows this, I left and I went, I called Edmund Lamacchia, who was our produce guy. And I said, Edmund, I'm scared shitless. I don't even know what to do. I got the job, but I don't know what to do. <laughs> and, uh, but you know, you just face that moment of fear and you push through it because you're doing the work you wanna do and you push through it and you find those qualities. So I like that. I like, I like so like uh, resiliency, you know, resiliency. We all know business is not a straight line. Stuff comes at you every day. Life comes at you every day. If you don't cultivate the willingness to be resilient uh, and be able to, to uh, respond and, st and stay the course, and uh, it's never, it's an up and down sideways thing. I, I mean, I've experienced this as, uh, it's kind of the excitement of business actually, the fact that it throws so many things at you from so many different directions. You know when you get up uh, that it's gonna come at you. When we first opened the store in Hawaii and we had a store in London, we could say truthfully that uh, the sun never sets on Whole Foods, right? And, and so we knew at any time of any day, something could happen. And by the way, in the grocery business, it never happens on Friday between nine and five. It always happens on Saturday afternoon when nobody's around. That's when the shit breaks, right? So um, resiliency is a quality you wanna cultivate. And I think, uh, and I think finally to uh, humility, um, I mean, well, I'm a, let me say one other one, open, open to learn. Um, one of my lifelong values is, is uh, uh, I want to keep learning. Curiosity, and that's, maybe that's a better word. Are you cultivating the curiosity and the openness in yourself to be able to continually learn? It doesn't matter who you learn from or where you learn from, but when you hear something that sounds right and it resonates with you, take it in, work with it, and then give it your own sort of form, right? You know when you hear somebody talking and there's a thing that happens and says, well, that's something that means something to me. Well, then take it and do something with it. So. So the ability to learn, the ability to listen, the ability to adapt and evolve, that all comes from staying open to learning as you go and grow. And Whole Foods was such a wonderful journey from that respect. Uh, our culture was one where uh, there was oversharing, if you will. Everybody said everything. There was feedback on everything. You couldn't do anything without somebody giving a point of view on, which is okay, right? But this ability to be in a place where you can learn things is pretty cool. And I think also humility. Um, and that's not something you can say about yourself. Uh, that's something somebody else has to say if that's true. But, and humility doesn't mean less than or you're not worth it. Humility means that you have the recognition that you're part of a team, that you're part of the human race, that, you're, that you don't know everything, that you're part of, you're always learning from other people, and that you're showing up in a way that reflects and respects that sort of uh, greater world that exists and that you're part of, and that you have the honor and the pleasure, in my case, of being a leader at Whole Foods. It was a true honor a true joy to be in that role and have the honor of doing that and treat it with the respect that it deserves. Um, and recognize, I think, that uh, the six, number six thing for me is humanity. Uh, I said there were seven, this is my six humanity that, this is a lot of what's being talked about this morning, was this idea of uh, business as a, the greatest thing, uh, the greatest people, and pe business is about people first. Let's just, let's just get right to it. It's about people first, okay? And it's about, that means that in every moment that you're a business person or that you're a leader, you have this simple choice. Are you gonna lift people up or are you gonna take them down? In every moment, in every conversation. Think back, I've had people come up to me years later and say, you remember when you walked the store and you said this to me? John mentioned to me last night we were visiting and he said, uh, who was it John? Somebody came up to you years later and said something to you about uh, something that, that John had said to him. And, you know, you never know in any moment uh, what that's gonna mean to somebody. You just don't have the full, full context. But this idea that, uh, that in every moment you choose the path of humanity, of greater humanity, it doesn't mean you're gonna be perfect, doesn't mean you're gonna get it right every time, but it means that you're gonna strive to use through your business and through your leadership 
to bring greater humanity in the world, to bring us together more. One of the beautiful things about physical stores is that it brings people together, right? These, these moments happen where people connect and join. That's what human beings love to do. The online world struggles with that, and which is why you see the online world coming back to the physical world and joining with it, because it cannot be complete without doing both, right? And they struggle to create that same sort of connection online. It's not, it's not a complete human experience. It needs to be matched with the physical so that the two can join together. So Schweitzer, who everybody, some of you know, that have known for a while, is, my, is one of my real idols, uh, was a Nobel Peace Prize runner in 1963. Um, but he said, um, the true opportunity for, for, for mankind is to display true humanity to each and every one of us in every moment that presents itself. So you think about these moments that you're in, small or big. I try to remember that every time I'm at TSA and they piss me off, right? Or some situation where, you know, it's just driving you crazy. The, the person in front of you, is, you're, you're always in these situations, uh, in life situations, where you can choose, are you going to take your humanity up or are you going to take it down? And by the way, when you're with people that you're working with, particularly when you're in a leadership position, your words matter. And when you choose to believe in somebody and believe and, and give that to them, the gift that you give them can last a lifetime. On the other hand, if you choose to take them down in some sort of an irresponsible way, that can cause real lasting damage. And so, again, as a leader, your role is uh, in every moment that presents itself, in every moment that presents itself, uh, that conversation with a team member when you're walking a store, that conversation with a team member when you're having a team meeting, whatever it is, are you holding yourself to the standard of striving for greater humanity? And that's the only way, and that is the only way I think business starts to realize its fullest potentials. It's not just the mission, it's not just the values, it's not just the striving for those things, it's also the, the the sum of the parts is greater, which is to say that business is so human and it's all about people and it's all about bringing greater humanity and setting that example of, of that humanity in the world. And then the final one for me is love. And I don't mean love like uh, gutter love or, you know, I'm talking about the Greek sort of agape or whatever the Greek word is about the highest form of love, um, which is just truly caring, genuinely caring for another person and um, for each other collectively. And so I think one of the things business can do is, and what, what leaders can lead with love and businesses can grow with love and can exhibit love in their presence in the world. Um, and it's gonna take different forms and fashions with different businesses, but, but this idea of bringing, uh, of leading with love. Now what does that actually mean? Um, you know, I think that's, st I'm still trying to figure that out, but one thing my greatest learning as a leader has been uh, over some 40 years now um, is to, when I got past this idea that I had to do it all myself. And, you know, my last name is Rob, R-O-B-B. -B. People used to say in the beginning, well, your, your, your leadership style, you just rob people of their power. Chris hit, hit, with me, hit me with that when I was like, you know, right at, right at, I was like, okay, whoa, you know, this is how I'm showing up. But, but uh, what I've realized over the years as I've grown as a leader and grown as a person is that the greatest uh, thing you can do is look at another person uh, and realize, uh, and, and not only look at them and say these words, but actually feel it in your heart, is the amazing potential of each and every human being. And uh, that's what love is for me, is this idea of realizing that I'm here as a leader to help them unlock, unfold, trust, believe, let that flow out, whatever. And then in, by doing that, we're going to encourage that thing to happen through the entire company or through the entire organization. And it's amazing to me that in my role now, working with multiple CEOs, young CEOs, which I really enjoy doing, is they're not asking so much. They're, they're ahead of me in terms of where the market is, their technology, their data acumen, all these sorts of things. The questions they're asking me is, well, how do you grow a company with love? How do you build a culture? How do you grow and build a culture at the same time? These are the questions that young leaders are wrestling with about how to bring these sorts of qualities to a company. They recognize, as was just said, that the customers today are gonna to support those companies who show up in the marketplace in that way. With a great idea, yes, but also in a way that feels resonant with their own values. So, in sum, uh, my seven thoughts on leadership for you, which again, I know are probably just things you've already thought about or you have your own version of these same words, but one, have a clear vision 
describe, a, 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 give us a hill to climb. Give us a reason for being that gets me, that gets everybody excited in the morning to get up and go to work. And, and number two is hone your strategic abilities to be able to execute that because there's so much noise out there right now. In the grocery business alone, there's probably, you know, uh, 400,000 SKUs. And every six months they turn over maybe, you know, 50%. There's a lot of noise and a lot of churn. So for you to rise above and get noticed, you're going to have to have a clear path of thinking. You're going to have to say no to things. You're going to have to say what to say no and what to say yes to. And you're going to have to learn to say hell yes to that and double down on that because you can't do all things. Second of all is this idea of team and talent. Talent that um, you, know, you need great people. It's an exciting thing. And what does it truly mean to be part of a team? Have you really thought about what that means and the gift, the gift that comes from being part of a team? And third is this idea of both collaboration and confrontation, developing those skill sets inside yourself as a leader where you recognize the power and the place for both and uh, that they both have a healthy place in a healthy company. Fourth is uh, my favorite, which is culture. It's all about culture. It's all about how people feel shopping with you and working with you. Does it feel like a place you want to be? And are you doing everything you can as a leader to create that sort of place where people want to be? They want to connect. They want to shop. They want to work with you. They want to advance this hill. They want to take the hill together with you. Fifth is the qualities of leadership. You know, I'm sure you have your own list. Those are mine. Uh, I would just say again, I believe that of all of them, authenticity and vulnerability, the ability for people to feel that you're real, uh, that they're talking with a real person, that you can understand the life situations they're in even though you're at a different place. Uh, it's so important to cultivate that, and that only ha comes from you doing the work on yourself. Uh, the idea of humanity, that we're here as businesses and collective businesses and conscious capitalism to lift up the humanity in this world, which is the care and concern for one another and for us all together. And finally, the, the quality of your heart, the quality of love, where you think about others and you look at them and you think about, man, I can't believe uh, what's inside that person. I cannot believe the potential that person has. I can't believe that look in their eye that's telling me, you know, uh, if I just have a little bit of room, I can do this. And just a word from me will help them to really believe that that's possible. So I hope the thoughts have been helpful. Thank you very much. It's good to see you all again.